Good morning. Good morning. Happy Father's Day. Welcome today. This is one of the commandments. It says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or your daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Amen. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Let's stand together as we begin our time of worship today. My Savior, Redeemer, lifted me from the miry clay. Almighty, forever, I will never be the same as you came near. Sing that again. 
Amen. Praise the Lord. From Isaiah 12, in that day you will say, I will praise you, Lord. Although you were angry with me, your anger has turned away and you have comforted me. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord himself is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. In that day you will say, give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done and proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for he has done glorious things. Let this be known to all the world. Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel among you. Amen. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, blessed be the name of the Lord, the glories of my God and King. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He breaks the power of canceled sin. Blessed be the name. Let's sing that last verse because that's something to praise and shout about, right? I will not ever forget the day when Jesus washed my sins away. And I know some of you are just waiting for me to give you permission to clap. Your toes are tapping in your little shoes or your flip-flops or your sandals, whatever. I know you want to clap. So let's do it. Let's clap for joy and sing aloud to the God of our salvation, right? Amen. I never shall forget that day. Blessed be the name of the Lord. When Jesus washed my sins away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be Blessed be the name. 
Praise the Lord. Thank you. You may be seated. We have a few quick announcements here this morning. A week from yesterday, it's going to be a family float trip. Uh, Cindy is not here today, but I understand you can speak with Pastor Samuel. If you are interested in being a part of that float trip, they're going up to the Buffalo, and uh, I think they're going to have a good time. I know they will. Um, so check with them about that. This coming week, we've been talking about this for a while. We have district assembly here. It begins tomorrow night with the NMI convention. That's at 7 p.m. Uh, you will not want to miss. The, the evening services are fantastic. If you want to see how we conduct business in the church, if you have time, you can come during the day on Tuesday and Wednesday and see how things like that are done uh, at the district and general church level. And you're welcome to come, but I really, really encourage you to be here Monday night, Tuesday night, and Wednesday night, if at all possible. You will hear uh, a missionary, special missionary speaker tomorrow night, and then Tuesday night, our district superintendent speaks, and then Wednesday night, Dr. Graves speaks and leads an ordination service, which is always a special time as ministers are ordained into the ministry in the Church of the Nazarene. Our summer camps are upon us. They begin a week from tomorrow. That's the first one is kids camp. So, uh, that's June 27th through July 1st. The second one, teen camp, July 18th through the 22nd. If, if you've got a child, they, they need to know, I would say immediately, like right after church. You tell Pastor Samuel, uh, I'm sorry, Pastor Freddie, uh, and let him know if you have a child that wants to go. The church pays half of the tuition to go to these camps. We believe that much in what goes on at these camps that we pay half of that. If you wish to be a part of funding one of those scholarships or any amount that you want to give towards that, half of a scholarship is $107.50. It's $215, children or teens, for this week of camp. And as you all know, for daycare or anything else along those lines, that's a pretty good deal for everything that they get to do and have fun down there. So just keep that in mind. If you want to put it in the offering, just mark, just say camp. If you're writing a check or if you're doing it online in the memo line, just note that on there. And it's wonderful. You guys always do a great job of coming through for that. And um, if you want to do more than that, talk to Pastor Freddie. He might tell you about somebody who needs their way paid. Okay, on uh, thank you, always for your generosity and giving to the church. The ministries of this church, as we come out of COVID, we're back in full swing, and it costs a little more money, but you guys are faithful, and we really appreciate your giving. You can give online at vrcn.church or via our mobile apps, uh, Apple or Android, or you can mail in your offering to 9860 Brockington Road, Sherwood, Arkansas, 72120. Or if you'd like to give today, there are giving slips in the seats there in front of you. And we have our plates out in the hallways. And those are collected. And uh, we really, really do appreciate your giving. Happy Father's Day. It's good. Yeah, yeah. Good, <laughs> good to be in the Father's house on Father's Day. Amen. Uh, we, at the end of the service, we have a little gift for the, all the fathers here today. And we, you just make sure you get one of those on your way out. I guarantee you, if you've got a sweet tooth, you're going to love it. <laughs> Hebrews 11.1, 1, this is the New Living version of this scripture. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. Our Father in heaven loves us dearly. And I know that on a day like today, there are a lot of people who have not had the privilege of seeing the heavenly Father in your earthly home. But that does not change the fact that he has given us a loving, living hope. Paul says in Romans, we were given this hope when we were saved. 
We already have something. We don't need to hope for it. But if we look, but if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently. Amen. Let's stand today as we continue in this time of worship together today. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name. Prepare our hearts to work. 
worship you. Prepare our hearts for holy ground. Let our defenses tumble down. Come do what only you can do. Prepare our hearts to worship you. prepare our hearts for this time in prayer the altars are open and you can gather around it if you've got something that's on your heart today that you want to take to the Lord we're going to sing this through one more time and you can gather around here with your praises your requests the things that are heavily weighing on you things that you're carrying on your heart today let's sing this and gather around prepare our hearts to worship you. to see you all here and prepared to worship, prepared to pray, prepared to hear the word of the Lord. And uh, I want to give us some prayer requests and please take note of these. And if one of them really stands out to you, that's the Lord speaking to you. Maybe to give some intercessory prayer uh, to one of these needs. I want to continue to pray for the George family. I know it's been kind of tough uh, with, between Ty and Brooke and they've had this little baby, which is a blessing, but there've been just these complications. So continue to pray for the George family. I uh, also want to pray for uh, our district assembly that's coming up, as Jason mentioned, that God's Spirit would rest on us in unusual ways. I've been praying that the Lord would rest on us in unusual ways for this time together. I also want to continue to pray for Danny Kimbrell. Good to see he and Nancy here, and we sure love you, and, and uh, we love your positive attitude through thick and thin. You've been a good example to us. I want to pray for uh, Wayne Campbell and his family as well, as he's uh, in the midst of cancer. Pray for Ivis Moore. She's still in the rehab there at uh, Spring Hill Baptist. So pray for her. She is getting stronger, getting better. And so uh, pray for both she and Jim. And then want to pray for Kenny McGee, um, his mother, uh, kind of at hospice care and uh, just kind of in this transition phase. So they're just praying for God's will to be done. So pray for Kenny and Sharon as they give constant care to his mother. Uh, also, I have a, a friend from college, Shree and I, uh, April Watson, uh, Aaron, her husband, was my roommate in college, uh, same age as us. They have six children, and she just found out that she has cancer. And so her name is April Watson. She wants us all to pray for her, of course, uh, but started with breast cancer, and it's gone to her brain and spine. And so pray for her, her husband, and her six kids as they wait on the Lord in this. And then finally, I'd like to, to ask somebody to come forward. Uh, our Lieutenant Colonel, Court Kozer, and his family, if they'd come forward. This is their last Sunday here. They're being uh, transitioned and moved over to Colorado Springs, Colorado. Uh, he's in the Air Force. And so if you come right here in the middle, I just want to pray over you. Uh, you can stand right here in the middle, and uh, we're not going to make you do anything or say anything. We're just going to pray over you. We just appreciate them being a part of our church for these years. Uh, God has blessed us through them, and so uh, we, we just love them and appreciate them. So if you think of it, pray, 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 pray for uh, Kirk Kozer and his family as they move on to, to uh, Colorado Springs. Unspoken request, would you just lift your hand to the Lord? Yes, all over this place. All right. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time together to worship you, to praise you, to give ourselves to you afresh and anew. 
For these that are at this altar, Father, we, we thank you that they have tender hearts to say, Lord, I have a need and I'm, I'm bringing it to you. For others that lifted their hands saying, remember me as you pray. And so, Lord, right now, I can't see into every heart, but you can. And you know exactly what they're talking about when they raise that hand up. It's more than just raising a hand. There is a big need behind that lifted hand. And so, Father, I pray that you would bless each one of those. And then, Lord, for all these we've mentioned, those that are sick, those that are ailing, those who are maybe transitioning on to heaven, for those who are giving care, we pray your strength over them. We pray, Father, that you'd bless our president, our vice president, the cabinet. We pray that you'd bless those in authority over us. Give them wisdom. Give them godly leadership. Give them godly counsel, Father, around them. Lord, you can do all things. And so we commit these situations in our nation to you. We pray for our military, Father. We thank you for them, for the protection they give to our country. We thank you, Father, for the Cozers and the blessing they've been to us. We thank you, Father, for the way that they've, uh, they've just jumped right in here and uh, they've been faithful to come. And Lord, I just pray your blessing over them as they head off to Colorado Springs. I hear it's a great place to go. I hear it's a great uh, station, a base to be a part of. And so would you just bless Court today? Help him, Lord, to know that he's in your hands. He's in the military, but Lord, he's in your hands. Thank you, Father, for his wonderful wife, Bree, and their son, Colby. I pray, Father, that you'd help them as they get adjusted to a new place in life, that your hand would be upon them in a wonderful way. And, Lord, as you've used them here, use them in Colorado Springs. May they be a beacon of light to those around them. And, Father, continue to use them in their mission work for you. They are Christians, and they're not ashamed of that. They are Christian, and I thank you for that. And, Lord, help Colby as he'll be making maybe new friends there. Encourage his heart, Father. Uh, I don't know what that's like to move like that as a little boy, but Father, you've got him in your hands as well. We commit him into your care as well. And Lord, for this morning's service, we pray that you'd bless us in a wonderful way, not so that we can say we got blessed, but so we can become a blessing to somebody else that is not here right now. Lord, for those that uh, maybe have a, a need so strong they'd never voice it to anybody, Lord, you already know it, and I pray that you would encourage their heart this morning. We pray you'd speak to us, this morning through your servant, hide your servant behind the cross, and may we hear the very words of Jesus this morning, for we pray all of these things in Jesus' holy name. And all God's people said, amen. Thank you, thank you. You may be seated. It's our privilege this morning to have one of our general superintendents of the Church of the Nazarene. There are six general superintendents in the Church of the Nazarene that cover the globe. A lot of traveling goes into that. And we're, we're glad to have Dr. David and Sherrod Graves here this morning with us. Uh, they've already been a blessing to me, just kind of talking with them. Uh, he made me laugh really hard this morning over here. Just a, a great guy, a great spirit about him. Just a little bit about him. Dr. Graves was chosen for the highest elected office in the denomination at the 27th General Assembly held in Orlando, Florida in 2009. At the time of his election, Dr. Graves was the senior pastor of College Church of the Nazarene in Olathe, Kansas, where he had served since 2006. Prior to College Church, he served as director of Sunday School Ministries for the Church of the Nazarene's International Headquarters from 2001 to 2006. He has had pastoral assignments in Kansas, Ohio, Tennessee, Oklahoma, and North Carolina. Dr. Graves is a graduate of Olivet Nazarene University and received his Master of Divinity degree from Nazarene Theological Seminary. He's the author of three books and has written for numerous publications. And maybe better than all of that that I just said is that Dr. Graves and his wife Sharon have four married children, Michael, John, Stephen, and Rachel, and 12, I'm going to get this word right, beautiful grandchildren. So uh, we, we, he has jur jurisdictional assignments are Asia, Pacific region, and the South Central United States and Southern Nazarene University. I tell you what, as he comes, I want you to, to uh, pray for him, that God will speak through him. But let's give him uh, just due respect as he comes. Dr. Graves, come and speak for us. Well, what a joy it is to be with you today, and we are delighted that... Uh, we were able to make it and to be here for not only today, but also for the district assembly and the ordination service. And uh, as Jason said, if you're available and never been to one, you might want to make it uh, part of your schedule and come where the air conditioning will be. You might need it by uh, Wednesday, but we're delighted that you're here. And today we want to honor all of our fathers and grandfathers 
If you're a father or a grandfather, would you just raise your hand right where you are? Well, we honor you today. Do we have any great-grandfathers? Great, wonderful. Any great-great-grandfathers? No, but great-grandfathers. So, well, we appreciate you and appreciate all of your lives. How many grandparents do we have here? Raise your hand. Yeah, that goes with you as well. And today we want to thank you for your lives. We want to thank you for your work. We want to thank you for your love, for your families, and for your faithfulness to God. I'd like to ask you all of you a question this morning. Fathers, grandfathers, great-grandfathers, grandmothers, mothers, all of you. How many of you would be willing to die for your children? Or your family? Three of you. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. <laughs> Depends on the type of death, right? <laughs> yeah, you have to clarify that a little stronger. I think most of us would say we would be willing to give our lives for our children. A kidney? Yeah. Bone marrow? Absolutely. A lung? Yeah. I don't know about heart, though. That might be a little hard to do, right? If we'd be willing to die for our children, I have another question for you. Would you be willing to live for your children? It's one thing to say, yeah, I'll die for my children. It's another thing to say, am I really willing to live for our children? The question is, how do we do that? How do we live a life for our children, for our grandchildren? Well, I think the Apostle Paul gives us some instruction about that from the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6, beginning with verse 1. And uh, follow along as I read this. And this is for all of us. How many of you are children? You've had parents. Yeah, we all have. So this applies to all of us. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with the promise that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. And then he speaks specifically to fathers. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we do realize today that uh, we are so thankful for our fathers, our grandfathers, those who have gone before us. In fact, we're thankful for our moms and our parents. We're thankful for those who have become spiritual grandparents or spiritual parents to us. And today, Lord, I pray that you would help each and every one of us to hear from your word, not just uh, sitting back and saying, well, I'm not a father today, this doesn't apply to me. It applies to all of us. And I pray that you would help us to hear your word today. And we ask that you might speak to our hearts on how we can better be your disciples, followers of you, and the influence that we can have on other people. And so, Lord, we just pray that you would speak to us now in these moments, for we ask it in your name. Amen. So how do we really live for our children? I want you to think about this, not only your own children, but especially in the church We are a family. Do you know that? And there have been those people in our lives who have been spiritual parents to us. Some have been spiritual fathers. Others have been spiritual mothers. Some have been spiritual grandparents. And I can tell you this as a pastor of congregations, I am so thankful for those people who have invested in my life as a pastor. They have prayed for me. They've interceded for me. They have become my adopted spiritual parents or grandparents, and I'm so thankful. So today I want all of us to understand our role not only as a biological father or a grandfather, but also as a spiritual father or spiritual grandfather or grandmother today. So how do we do that? How can we live for our children, even in the church? Well, the first thing that the Apostle Paul points out is we need to have patience. He said, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Don't make your children angry by the way you treat them, one translation says. As fathers and parents, we are bound to upset our children and irritate our children sometimes. 
because discipline and correction are seldom enjoyable experiences. I can honestly say to you that I never, ever, after my mom or dad disciplined me, I got up and said, thank you, I really needed that. <laughs> I am so thankful you did that to me. No, I can't imagine, I can't, and I got it daily, you know, but I can't, I can't remember one time where I actually said that to them because for most children, that, that correction is not desirable. However, Paul is not telling us that, listen, Paul is, Paul is not, not telling us that we shouldn't discipline our children, but that we shouldn't provoke our children to the point of resentment or anger or exasperation. And I think there's different things that will provoke our children. I think sometimes over-controlling a child or disciplining them, restricting them too much, being too harsh in our punishment or our discipline can stifle the growth of a child or the maturity and, and cause them to react or even to rebel. And Paul says, don't exasperate, don't irritate your children by harsh or oppressive or unfair rules or regulations or unrealistic expectations. I like what the author Patrick Morley tells the story about being so uptight when his children were born. And he was so worried about it, everything that they were doing. They don't break something. They don't scratch something. And, and he would constantly, as he admits in his book, he said, sometimes my blood boiled when I spotted a new scratch in the luster of a smooth grain coffee table. And finally, his wife couldn't stand it any longer. She had heard him go off on, his, on the kids. And so finally she said to him, you leave my children alone. I will not have you ruining a million-dollar child over a $300 coffee table. I think we need to give our children some slack. Um, my mom gave us some slack as we used to play basketball in the bedrooms on her curtains that she hung. Now, quite honestly, we didn't let our three boys do some of that. But we don't want to put unrealistic expectations. We need to allow our kids to have some freedom to be kids. But I think in our day and age, the problem for most of us is not over-controlling. But I think the problem in our society today is under-controlling our children. And that in itself can cause a child to provoke a child. That, I think that's the most prevalent problem. There's a tendency that we see all around us for us to pamper or to indulge or to give our children everything imaginable, even beyond what is good for them or what is beneficial or even what they need. We were at Walmart just this week and, and there was a kid following their mom around. I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this. And I, I felt like saying, shut up, kid. <laughs> but I can't, I can't do that anymore. <laughs> and finally, the mother, finally, after about 100 times of them saying that, and I, unfortunately, they were following us around, she says, you don't need that. But I want it, but I want it. And she said, this is last time I'm going to bring you with me to a store because every time we go to a store, you want something. Well, there's a tendency in our, our day and age to pamper, to give in. Sometimes I think it's simply for the reason to escape responsibility for a child, to keep them from interrupting our time, to get them out from under our feet. And I think sometimes it's our own fault because we are trying to relive our own childhood in our kids because we didn't get what we wanted, so we need to give our kids more than we ever got ourselves. And so we enroll our children in every activity, every sport, everything. And soon what happens, and their studies are showing us, soon our kids and our grandkids don't have any time to be kids. They don't have any time to be young. We stay in hotels all the time, and I can't believe how many traveling sports teams we run into. 
and we were at one hotel, <laughs> and they were, the kids must have been six years old. And I thought, here they are taking a whole weekend to play in some tournament at six years of age, seriously. But that's what our culture has kind of forced onto us, is that you have to keep your kids involved. You have to give in to them. You have to, and what happens as a result of that is any time as a family has been eroded to the point we don't have any time. I would encourage you parents to evaluate how much time you're spending doing things instead of how much time you're spending being together as a family. And sometimes we give in to their bad behavior, their whining, their pouting, their sulking, their temper tantrums, just to say enough. I just need some peace and quiet. But I think there's another thing that we can do provoking our children, and that is living an inconsistent life before them where we set up rules for them that we don't even live by ourselves. We tell our children one thing, and then we live something totally different. How confusing that is, how threatening that is to our children, and how many children grow up to be involved in things. Why? Because they've watched their mom and dad do them. Listen to kids talk. Their attitudes, many of times they are just reflecting what they've lived with and what they've heard because the parents are doing it. How many kids get involved with smoking or drinking or drugs because they've watched their parents do it? How many times young men are, are involved in pornography? Why? Because they were first introduced to it by what their dads were reading or watching. And I want you to know that we have a responsibility to live a consistent life before our children. Does that mean that our children will grow up to be everything that we hope them to be? No, it doesn't. Because you know what? Kids will eventually grow up and have their own free will. But it's important for us to understand that if we plant good seed, the chances are a lot better that we'll get a good harvest than if we don't plant any seed or we plant bad seed. Let's plant the good seed so the Holy Spirit can use our lives and what we've invested into our children so that the Holy Spirit can use that and draw them to himself at some point in their lives. As I've been reading through the Old Testament, I'm, I'm struck by a phrase. It really just always just grips my heart. It's repeated over and over again in First and Second Kings. And here's one example, 1 Kings chapter 22. It says, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Now watch this. And walked in the way of his father and in the way of his mother. How many kings throughout Israel and Judah's history came to the point where they lived a certain life because they walked in the way of their father or their mother. We need to have patience with our children. We need to allow them to grow mature, but we need to be planting the good seed of the gospel into their hearts so that the Holy Spirit can use it to grow up. Patience, the first thing Paul talks about. But notice in this verse, he also talks about priority of time. He said, do not exasperate your children. Instead, Bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. And to bring them up in the instruction of the Lord, that you know what that it requires time. It requires an investment on our part. There's an old study that Dr. James Dobson cited. Research it was done that they wanted to determine how much time a middle class father would spend in contact with his one year old child. And so they asked the dads that first, and the dads thought, well, uh, I probably spend a couple hours a day. Well, as they put uh, microphones on their shirts, and they did a study of this, and as the result was that the average daily time with each father spent with his children, you ready for this? 37 seconds with a one-year-old. That's an average of what? 
10 to 15 seconds in each instance. Or we say, oh, well, well I, you know, we don't, we, don't have a, we don't have a lot of quantity, but boy, the time I give is quality time. Well, I want to tell you something. Now with the, the cell phones and with text messages and searching the Internet, I tell you, I see all around me that our parents are not spending a whole lot of time with their children. Oh, we're together all the time. They're always with me. Yeah, but are you always with them? We have four married children, and I watch the interactions they have and how many times they're searching something on Amazon while their kids are talking to them or how many times they're looking for this or looking for that or how much time they're diverted from their attention. Again, this week, we, we saw a little girl. She kept saying to her mom, Mom, watch this. Mom, watch this. Mom, watch this. I was watching. <laughs> and I understand that your kids can say that a hundred times a day. Mom, watch this. Okay, I am. Watch this, Mom. Listen to this, Dad. In these devices, in the Internet, in our computers, in our iPads, have become one of the greatest distractions from being with our children that the enemy has ever created. And I would encourage you parents to just not only tell your teenagers, put the phone away because they are distracted from being with you because of these and turn them off and actually talk. I, I think that's one of the great things about grandparenting. And I understand it now. I didn't understand it until it became one. But our grandkids love to come and spend time with us. You know why? Because we set everything else aside and we're with them, especially my wife, Sharon. She plays games with them. She does things with them. Can I ask you just to be with your families? Take time to have meals together, even if it's fast food and you bring it home. Just spend some time together. And we need to understand that if we're too busy to be with our families, with our kids and our grandkids, then you know what? Maybe we're too busy. I love the story. A first grader asked his mom, why his dad always came home with the, with the briefcase full of papers and work to do. And she said, well, honey, dad's got a very busy job and he has a whole lot of work to do and he can't get it all done at the office. And so the first grader thought about it for a moment. He said, well, mom, maybe dad could ask to be put in a slower group. <laughs> Let that sink in. You'll understand what a first grader would be thinking. Parents and grandparents, that means that we need to say no to some claims. And I like what one author says, if you can't say no to some claims... Your life will drip away like a leaky faucet and you won't make much of a splash anywhere. Try to be present. Try to listen. Try to invest your time with those that God has entrusted to us. And I know right now if you have small kids, if you have teenagers, it seems like they will never grow up. But I can tell you, it goes by very quickly. And one day it will be, they'll be gone. So spend the time. Make time to be together. Now, I have to give you a little honest confession here. For the last 13 years, as a general superintendent, that hasn't afforded us a whole lot of time to be with our kids or our grandkids. But I want to tell you, every moment that we're together, we cherish it. 
You have to make some time. You have to make some efforts. Sometimes you even have to move, get closer to them so that you can invest in their lives. There's a third thing that I think Paul is telling us, and that is we need to protect our families. He said, fathers, don't exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. Now, listen, when, when our children watch on the average, listen to this, the average 37 hours of television a week and another five hours a week on our computers, and we are only spending 37 seconds a day in conversation, whose values do you think they're going to accept as their own? I was listening to a podcast even this morning early and it's talking about what's happening in our society today with the whole transgender thing and sexuality thing and gender. I, he said on that from their research that they're finding is that most of our teens are buying into that type of thinking, not because what their parents are saying, but because what they're watching and listening to on their phones and on the Internet and through social media. And if we're delegating all of their times to our kids, to a, to a device, to the Internet, to social media, and we're not spending any time in instruction, well, wait, wait, time out. That's why I bring them to church. Okay, great. Two hours a week. And they're spending 42 hours on devices or television. 42 verses 2, whose values will they have? And that's why he's saying, listen, parents, bring them up in the training, in the instruction of the Lord. Uh, we need to somehow take hold of the reins of spiritual leadership in our home. We must begin to be intentional about teaching our children our values or they're going to adopt someone else's values. Don't leave it to the schools. Don't leave it to television. Don't leave it to the Internet. It's part of our responsibility and, pri and privilege to train them up. Uh, the word Paul uses for training or nurture means the whole training and education of children, which involves the cultivation of their minds and their morals, their reproof and their punishment, correcting their mistakes and curbing their passions, which leads to the increase of virtue. But the second word he uses is instruction, which means counsel or exhortation or correction. So this is what he is saying, that we are to bring them up in the training to help form their values, their morals, their beliefs, to teach them about what God says and how they are loved and how they are cared for by God, we need to teach our children that they are precious to Almighty God and that he has a special plan for their lives and that God will give his children power and strength that no matter what happens, no matter how great the trials may be, we can still trust Almighty God. And we need to teach our children that. Well, they get to observe my life. Observation is not, it needs to be intentional of letting them know, hey, God created you. God created you not as junk or second-rate person, and that's what the world will tell them, but God has created you as his own precious treasured possession, and he has a special plan for your life, and that if you will follow him, that life may be full of temptations, may be full of pitfalls, but that can easily rob us of joy and mess up our lives. Look, if you follow God, he has a special plan for you. And even if things don't go quite the way you want them to, you can still trust him. You can still trust him because he is working in your behalf. And we need to allow our children to know that we are serving a faithful, loving father. You know the, what the world's telling him? That God is full of judgment and is bigoted, and he is against people, 
and he hates people. That's what the world's trying to do. He just wants to punish them and send them to hell. That's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is one who said that for God so loved the world. You're in the world, aren't you? For God so loved us. He loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus, to come to this world, to walk among us, to give his life on Calvary's cross so that we might be in an intimate, personal relationship with him. Isn't that great? That's what our father says. And that he loves us so much that he knew the plans he had for you while you were still in your mother's womb. And they were plans to bless you and prosper you and to give you a hope and to give you a future. And that if you follow him in your ways, that he will lead you, he will guide you, he will protect you, he will strengthen you, and he'll lead you to your final destination. That you can count on our Heavenly Father. Why? Because he is a good, good God. Amen? That's what we need to tell our children. There's going to be bumps along the way. Did you know there's some potholes on the interstate? Doesn't mean you're not going to stay on the interstate, though, does it? There's some potholes. There's some trials. There may be some detours in your life. But I want you to know that with your God, he will lead you the right way to go. I'd hate to be doing this job if I didn't have a program on my phone called Waze. Any of you know about Waze? W-A-Z-E. How many of you know about Waze? Raise your hand, I'll go on. It tells me where to go. It tells me when there's cars on the side of the road. It even tells you when there's a police ahead. It's a wonderful thing. And I want to tell you something. I have many times repented to Waze and said, I'm sorry I didn't trust you because Waze has never led me astray. I want to tell you something. We got something better than Waze. We have an almighty God who loves us and cares for us and he knows the detours and he knows where the wrecks are. He knows where he can give us warning and he will lead us if we will follow him. And that's what we as fathers and grandfathers, eat. listen, even in the midst of our own failures, in the midst of our own frailty, and we might not be perfect. Well, good news for you, you aren't perfect. But even in the midst of that, we can tell our children that God loves them. And he wants to work in their lives. And he wants to lead and guide and direct them. There's one last thing that I'd like to say to you. And I, I add this from, to what Paul instructs us. Parents, parents, this includes moms too. Grandparents. Youth workers, children's teachers, fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord. We need to pray for our children. We need to pray for our children. We, we can make no greater contribution to the life of our kids in this church or in your home than to pray for the well-being of our children, to intercede for them in our daily prayers. We can pray that they'll have a saving faith, that they'll have a sanctifying faith, that they'll have a growing faith, that they will have an independent faith that will be theirs. That we can pray for them to be strong and healthy in body, mind, and spirit. We can pray that they'll have a sense of destiny, that God has a plan for their life. We, we can pray for protection. Look, we need to pray a, a hedge of protection around our kids. Do you know that? in our own homes and in our church, we need to pray a, a hedge of protection around our kids that God would protect them from evil influences, that God would protect them from drugs and alcohol and premarital sex, that we need to pray that God would protect them and would give them a future that he has planned out for them. We need to even be praying for their future mates, for them to have a life that would bring honor and glory to God. And the greatest thing that we could do on this Father's Day as a church, as fathers, as grandfathers, as great-grandfathers is to pray and intercede for our children and for our teens and our kids, no matter how old they get. We pray 
and through our prayer and the example of our lives, we have a, can have a confidence that God will work in them. Well, most of us said we'd be willing to die for our children. The real question this morning is, are we willing to live for them? To be involved, having patience, spending the time, giving them a priority in our lives, and interceding and praying for our kids. It's a great task that we have. What a great responsibility, great privilege. And I pray today that you will be the type of father and grandfather, great-grandfather, parent, that your kids and that God needs you to be. Amen? Amen? Let's stand together. Father, we thank you for this special day that is set aside for us to recognize and honor those who have meant so much to us in our lives. Lord, we thank you for all the fathers of this church and for the grandfathers and great-grandfathers and for the parents that are here, and for those who have served as spiritual parents to so many children and teens down through the years. Lord, we thank you for them. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to live for our children, that we would obey what the Apostle Paul, the instruction that he is giving us, that that we would not exasperate our children. Instead, we'd bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. And we understand that requires time and it requires an investment of our lives. Lord, but I pray that you would help us to do that, that you would just not take it for, we would not take it for granted, but that we would give them instruction and counsel and, and correction when they need it. And that we'd let them know that you are a good, good God. And that you are a heavenly father. And that you want to be involved in their lives. And you want to work in their behalf. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to do our part. You've already done your part. You continue to do your part. And we know that you are faithful and that you will work. And so, Lord, we just honor all of them that are here today. Help all of us, Lord, to be faithful for the next generation faithful to our kids, our grandkids, our great-grandchildren, and that we would be involved in, in, in being used by you to make an eternal difference in their lives. And for all this, Lord, we thank you and we praise you, for we ask it in your name. Amen. Amen. And let's sing together. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never
today. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you and give you peace. Amen. You are dismissed.